I found this plant on the shore right next to a pond that's in a rural area near Albany, New York, USA. Filming was done in the morning of 10 September 2016. There were several of these plants in the area and all of them contained enormous numbers of these small plant-sucking bugs, which I think are aphids. Aphids are actually true bugs belonging to the order Hemiptera. I was saddened to see so many aphids, knowing that all of these bugs would die, most of them very soon in potentially painful ways. One idea for reducing wild insect suffering could be to replace these plants that feed tons of aphids with other less juicy and less insect-ridden plants. That said, in analyzing whether this change is net positive, we would also have to look at the net primary productivity of the replacement plants, since even if plants don't feed many insects while they're alive, they feed invertebrates in the soil when they decompose. For this reason, the best approach of all is to reduce net primary productivity by preventing plant growth altogether in an area. I don't know exactly what kinds of aphids these are in this video, but I'll read some general information about aphids. This page says, quote, Almost every plant has one or more aphid species that occasionally feed on it, end quote. Of course, in practice, the density of aphids may differ dramatically between plant types. None of the other plants that I saw by the pond had noticeable aphid populations. According to this page, quote, aphids are soft-bodied insects that use their piercing, sucking mouth parts to feed on plant sap. They usually occur in colonies on the undersides of tender terminal growth. Heavily infested leaves can wilt or turn yellow because of excessive sap removal. While the plant may look bad, aphid feeding generally will not seriously harm healthy, established trees and shrubs. Infestations generally result from small numbers of winged aphids that fly to the plant and find it to be a suitable host. They deposit several wingless young on the most tender tissue before moving on to find a new plant. The immature aphids, or nymphs, that are left behind feed on plant sap and increase gradually in size. They mature in 7 to 10 days and then are ready to produce live young. Usually all of them are females and each is capable of producing 40 to 60 offspring. The process is repeated several times, resulting in a tremendous population explosion. Less than a dozen aphid colonizers can produce hundreds to thousands of aphids on a plant in a few weeks. Aphid numbers can build until conditions are so crowded or the plant is so stressed that winged forms are produced. These winged forms fly off in search of new hosts and the process is repeated. End quote. This article says, quote, Nymphs and adults feed in the same way. Their mouthparts consist of a slender tube with two sharp stylets running down each side. All these are enclosed in the sheath-like labium and are held horizontally below the thorax when not in use. During feeding, the labium is bent and shortened as the stylets and central tube are pushed through the epidermis of the leaf or stem until they reach the sieve tubes of the phloem in a vascular bundle. Saliva is injected through the puncture to begin the digestion of the sap and cytoplasm, and the fluids are then pumped up by muscular movements of the gullet into the alimentary canal. The fluid pressure existing in most plant cells probably assists the flow of liquid through the aphid's mouth parts. Most aphids seem to take in from the plant sap more sugar than they can assimilate, so that their feces consist of a sweet syrup, honeydew, 
that has passed out of the anus. End quote. This article says regarding aphids, quote, the basis for this extraordinary productivity is a method of feeding, tapping the plant's own nutrient sap stream in the phloem sieve tubes. In a turgid plant, this sap is under pressure, and when the rostra of feeding aphids of various types were severed, sap was observed to exude from the stylet stumps left in the plant. Mittler found that the rate of exudation was not appreciably less than the rate of honeydew output by intact T. salignus feeding on the same willow stems. T. salignus is a type of aphid. Quote, sucking insects, unquote, thus appears to be a misnomer for most aphids and to imply an underestimation of their parasitic status. A cell tapped by T. salignus is refilled by its neighbors approximately 100,000 times per hour. The work done by this remarkable and little understood pump in the plant accounts for the very high rates of food ingestion recorded for some aphids, compared with some of the most voracious of chewing insects." End quote. The table shown here is taken from this paper and illustrates the high rates of food ingestion by aphids. I saw an ant crawling on the aphid-infested plants and in the grass. I don't know if the ant was collecting honeydew from the aphids, or if it just happened to be here. This article says, quote, Aphids feed on phloem, which poses two problems. First, phloem contains high concentrations of sugars. To avoid being literally sucked dry by the high osmotic potential of phloem fluid, Aphid guts convert the abundant simple sugars into long-chain oligosaccharides. Aphids then excrete the excess sugar-rich honeydew, which often attracts ants. The ants protect aphids from predators. Second, phloem fluid contains an unbalanced spectrum of essential amino acids. Thus, aphids harbor endosymbiotic bacteria, Buchnera aphidicola which provide aphids with many essential amino acids. The Buchnera genome underwent a dramatic reduction in gene content to about 500 genes soon after the origin of the symbiosis about 200 million years ago. Buchnera have dispensed with most of the genes that would allow them to live in the wild, and they must import many essential proteins and biosynthetic products from the aphid cell. Thus, while aphids cannot live long without Buchnera, Buchnera also depends on aphids. This obligate mutualism between eukaryote and prokaryote might resemble early stages of organelle evolution. Aphids also possess facultative symbionts that confer other benefits, such as resistance to heat and to parasitoid attack. Most aphids develop without wings, investing the extra resources in more offspring. But as colonies grow and attract the attention of predators, they produce winged morphs that fly to new plants. Some aphids instruct plants to produce a gall, a novel plant structure that insulates aphids from the elements and predators. Aphids induce orderly and patterned plant growth, not cancerous growths by injecting unknown signals into plant cells. Furthermore, they can repair damaged galls caused by predators or meddlesome scientists. Again, aphids inject unknown signals into plant cells surrounding the wound, causing plant growth that mends the breach." End quote. You can see yellow spheres on the back sides of the aphids. These are defense secretions from the cornicles. According to Wikipedia, quote, the cornicle or siphuncle is one of a pair of small upright backward pointing tubes found on the dorsal side of the last segment of the bodies of aphids. These abdominal tubes exude droplets of a quick hardening defensive fluid containing triacyl glycerols called cornical wax. End quote. This page elaborates on the cornicles, quote, 
These hollow tubes secrete droplets of fluid by the contraction of tiny muscles located in the abdomen under the cornicle. That contraction forces the fluid from specialized sacs that line the inside of the cornicle. For years, scientists thought this liquid was honeydew. However, it was later discovered that honeydew is a waste product that exits the body through the digestive system. It's now understood that this second liquid actually contains lipids, hemolymph, and a substance called an alarm pheromone. Alarm pheromones are chemical cues that function as a type of emergency broadcast system that other members of a group can detect. It's given off most often when there is a predator nearby. In species with long cornicles, the aphids will flex their abdomens and smear the pheromone onto the predator in the moments before death. This action ensures that wherever the predator goes on the plant, the other aphids know before it even arrives." End quote. It's plausible that aphids are less intelligent per individual than most other insects. This paper says, quote, the specialized host-exploiting form is an obligate parasite. The familiar, typically apterous, viviparous, and parthenogenetic female reproducing its like. It evolved very early in the history of the group, and the variant of it known as the fundatrix, which hatches from the fertilized egg and exploits the spring flush of growth in the host, still presents more or less obviously the greatest degree of parasitic modification. The modifications are of the usual two kinds, reduction of sensory motor functions and hypertrophy of growth and reproductive functions, but aphids combine these in a distinctive way. The adult looks and lives like the juvenile stages, but these are never obligatorily sessile, and the adult is still the most active stage except in a few specialized cases, as it is in free-living insects. In this way, the aphids keep up to an extent varying among aphids and plants, with the constantly shifting, most favored feeding sites as plant development proceeds, or disperse from overcrowded positions to new ones on the same or neighboring plants. This retention in nearly all aphids of sensory motor powers greater than those retained by most coccids and many other parasites has accompanied not lesser but greater parasitic specialization in other respects." End quote. This study reports in its abstract, quote, probing behavior of Aphis fabi scopoli and Rapalosophum potti l was tested in different stress situations normally occurring in aphid plant studies, such as interruption of feeding or starvation, transfer to a new plant, and attachment to the electrode wire. The DC electrical penetration graph, EPG technique, and a honeydew clock were used to collect data on behavioral effects of these stress conditions. As a general effect, an interruption of feeding behavior acted as a reset, i.e., the same sequence and time course of probing events were shown, irrespective of the interruption's duration, from 1 to 100 minutes. Nevertheless, some minor differences were found, especially in A. Fabi. Increased interruption times, deprivation from the host plant, stimulated the aphids to insert their stylets earlier. When A. Fabi was put back on its host plant after a one-minute interruption, phloem feeding started earlier than with longer interruption times, but only when it was put back to the same plant and feeding site on which it fed before. It is concluded that this effect is at least partly due to memory of previous probing feeding experience on the plant as it vanishes with longer interruption times. This explanation also holds for phloem salivation before starting sustained sap ingestion, which was reduced on the previous feeding site but only after the one minute interruption in A. Fabi. The aphid plant specificity appeared high in these effects. End quote. 
This article says, quote, larval and adult ladybirds eat a great many aphids, and a Nick Newman parasite causes many deaths by laying its eggs in the bodies of the aphids, end quote. I'll conclude by showing a few videos made by other people of aphids being attacked by natural enemies. While the phrase biological pest control normally conjures positive associations, that abstract sounding phrase actually refers to a process that involves immense amounts of suffering. <laughs> 